So I'm really, really excited to be here. Um, it, I've had a really great visit today, um, and it's been fantastic to talk all, to all the students, and I know the future is really going to be bright, and it, it makes me feel good about the future when I come out and talk to the students and see how engaged they are and how interested they are in the future and life and making things better for everyone. So I also just want to thank Elon for the opportunity to come out and meet with the students and engage and interact with everyone. It's been a really fantastic day, and so I really appreciate it. It makes me feel invigorated when I go into work, and okay, maybe there's a reason I'm doing this, and um, so you guys make it worthwhile, and I just wanna uh, say thanks again. So, um, today I'm gonna tell you about Argon on Chip. I'll tell you a little bit about my work in the middle, but really this is um, an expanding and exciting field. So I wanted to kind of give you a big overview about why it's so exciting and some of the really cool things and problems we think we're going to solve. And hopefully we'll have some slides soon. Um, but I'll go ahead and start out. Um, so it, a lot of this uh, started some time ago when we started uh, thinking about drugs. Uh, people take a lot of drugs in the U.S. Uh, often, almost everyone you know is probably taking a drug or two. Turns out about 55% of the people in the U.S. take drugs of one sort, usually prescription drugs. There's some other drugs also out there. Um, and often four more drugs. Um, and, and oftentimes it's, it's critical for life and quality of life. So it's not an optional kind of thing. Okay, I'll just go ahead and with my talk. Um, but uh, things, while drugs work really, relatively well, there are some big problems with drugs. Um, there can be a lot of unintended uh, drug side effects or, that we don't think about. So a good example is grapefruit. Often they'll tell you not to take grapefruit with a lot of your drugs. And so why is that? So it turns out if you're taking a statin, so a statin they give you for high cholesterol. And so it lowers your cholesterol. But if you eat grapefruit at the same time, the grapefruit uh, will basically um, block the enzymes that metabolize the statins in the small intestine, meaning there's more statin around for you to absorb. And you can actually end up overdosing on it. Um, also, you can, there are other drugs. For example, Allegra, which is a common antihistamine. If you have the snuffles and sneezes, it's over the counter now. If you eat grapefruit with your antihistamine, what happens is the grapefruit can actually block transporters in the small intestine that you use to take up the Allegra or antihistamine. So then you just don't get any effect from the antihistamine. So there's a lot of unanticipated, unintended consequences that we either don't predict, what, predict well or that the drugs aren't working. Uh, the other problem is if you go out to the grocery store, there's these health food aisles, and you can get all sorts of health foods like um, ginkgo biloba, you can get eucalyptol, you can get anything from A to Z, pomegranate extract, all kinds of extracts, and they often interfere with drugs in very unpredictable and unknown ways. And we don't really have a good mechanism to predict what's going to make drugs more toxic, what's going to make drugs less effective, and remember, 55% of us are out there taking all of these drugs. But there's actually even a bigger problem. If you look at uh, drugs and how they're being manufactured, the price of making just a single drug is just skyrocketing out of control. So right now, for one drug to get to market, for you to get a prescription to take, it's $1.5 billion. That's billion with a B and it's 12.5 years. So too long and way too much money. Oh, I had some great slides here. But if you talk to the drug companies, it's actually even, they'll tell you it's even worse. If you look at their R&D expenditures per year and you look at the number of drugs they're putting out, it can be as much as 111, I mean, um, 111, um, let me go back up. 12 billion per one drug. So they'll tell you it's much worse. Can you imagine 12 billion dollars for one drug? That's crazy. So just think about, okay, just think about 10 years and 1 billion. So in 10 years, 
I went from a flip phone to an iPhone, right? Google went from this simple little search engine to this international conglomerate that offers all kinds of services. There we go. Thank you. I was really getting revved up to do the hand mimes and things, so this is good. Um, Facebook and Twitter didn't exist. Wow, that's crazy. Um, there's a floppy disk. Probably you guys don't even know what that is. It has two megabytes. Ooh. Now we have a flash drive with 128 gigabytes. So that's 10 years of time, and we're making one drug? So let's see what a billion dollars will get you. You can buy the Lakers for a billion dollars. You can go to the moon and actually come back for a billion dollars. One drug to the moon and back? Something is not sinking. Something is not going right. So let's look at this. Let's look at how drugs are made. What's going on in all this time for all this money? So there's this discovery stage. There'll be compound libraries that people will screen through, try and figure out which are the best ones and pick maybe 20 or so leads. And then they'll take them into safety testing. They'll take them to mice, put them in mice, put them in tissue culture dishes, see how that goes, see what comes out at the end. Once something is looking kind of good, they'll start putting them into humans, just really small scale human trials, and then they'll get bigger and bigger, and if things are looking okay, they'll go all the way to, to phase four and begin the documents to license them. So this is looking pretty easy. Why is it taking so much money and time? So let's take a closer look at this. So if you look at this x-axis, there's a number of compounds, and the timeline is 12.5 years. So the first thing you'll notice is there's a huge dropout of drugs. So this is after they've done a lot of screening. There's a ton of drugs still in the pipeline, and they're trying to figure out which ones are going to work. And about midway through this, there's still a lot of drugs left that they're still trying to screen. Look at the x-axis on uh, y-axis on the far side. It's hundreds of millions of dollars per drug. So if you get 20 drugs that are entering into clinical trials, that's 20 times 100 million, and only one is popping out at the end. So too many drugs are making it into human clinical trials that are destined to fail. That means the one drug that makes it through has to sort of bear the cost of all the failures. So this is a big problem. So let's, why is this? Let's take a closer look. So the first thing you do when you're looking at drugs is you test them on cells in a tissue culture dish. Sounds good, it's an old technology, it's about 100 years old. Um, it's very mature, robust. It's easy to do high throughput screening, easy to read out. You see some gorgeous cells. We have all sorts of stains for cells to see what they're doing. Um, some nice blue cells up in the top. So really seems like a good idea. But let's look a little closer. First of all, what you'll do is you'll take your heart cells and you'll put them in one dish, liver cells in another dish, kidney cells in another dish, intestine in another. The first thing you'll notice, as soon as you put them, at, you take them out of the body, you put them in these dishes, they're changing. There's some really bizarre kidney or cardiac cell. They're not really the same. They're no longer behaving like a heart cell or like they were in the body, so they have very limited functionality. And as a result, they're very poor predictors of of drug efficacy and toxicity. Um, but even better, these, these uh, organs, these cells are all in different dishes. They can't talk to ever each other. Um, and who ever heard of a cell having organ failure? Doesn't happen. So a lot of the um, interesting, intricate physiologic attributes are totally missing. And finally, look at me. I'm not land flat in the tissue culture dish. It's just not the same. We're not constructed and built in tissue culture dishes. Okay, so if you make it through this step, what do you do next? You go into mice. Um, so this sounds pretty good. Mice, um, it's an intact functioning organism. All of the organs are connected to each other. We're, we're not that dissimilar to mice. So many of our genes are similar. It's a small size. It's going to be cheap. Um, and they're readily valuable. You can get tons of mice at low cost. So that sounds good, but let's look at some of the problems. So our genes are similar, but they're really not the same. Uh, diet and behavior of humans is very different, and it turns out that rodents are only 30 to 70 percent effective of toxicity to humans. So mice can take a lot of drugs that are totally toxic to us. Um, 
we can actually cure mice of cancer, but it doesn't translate into hearing, uh, curing hum humans of the same cancer. So the moral of the story is humans aren't 70 kilogram mice. So um, we're running into some trouble. And so many of these technologies are, are fairly obsolete um, and they're not that predictive. So now we take the drugs that have survived the mice and we put them into humans and not surprisingly, there's now a very high failure rate. And this is part of the problem. We're testing our drugs on very obsolete systems. It's the best we have. And about 90 to 95% of the drugs that reach human studies are gonna fail. 50% uh, are lost because of toxicity, mostly to the heart and liver. Another 50% nearly are lost because they just don't work. They cured the mouse, but they didn't have any effect on the humans. Well, let's give kind of a good example of toxicity. Um, they often occur because of complex interactions between organs. So if you're old enough, you may have taken Seldane. It was an antihistamine on the market a number of years back. And you take it in, you absorb it through your gut, it goes to the liver and it gets metabolized into an active form, almost all of it. But if any gets across the liver, you have this drug Seldane, and it turns out it's cardiotoxic in humans. Works great in mice. But in humans, if any goes unmetabolized, it causes, causes severe cardiac arrhythmia. So it had to come off the market. So a lot of wasted money. And so let's look a little closer at what's going on. So let's say you're an enterprising student, um, and I'm gonna tell you, I want you to go out and get the best car battery for me. Um, and not only that, you can't go on the internet. You've gotta go out and screen batteries. Uh, but you're not a very rich student, so all you've got is an electric bike. So you're gonna go out and you're gonna screen hundreds of batteries and see what works on your electric bike. And then you're gonna bring me a battery and you're gonna say, Nancy, this is a, it makes my bike go so fast and it goes forever. And I'm gonna say, okay. Thank you very much. I'm gonna take your bike and I'm gonna put it in my Subaru. And guess what, it's not gonna work. It was the wrong experimental system and this is kind of a good analogy for what's going on in the drug industry right now. But the bike was the best thing we had. And it gets even worse than that. Probably when you were screening, you screened a car battery for your bike and it didn't work so you concluded it wasn't gonna work in my car. So you missed some things that could have worked in my car because you had the wrong model system. And there's now some very well-known drugs on the market that we know would fail uh, animal and tissue culture trials. Aspirin is one, and you can see it says the wonder drug on the, if you're up close enough. Um, everyone takes it. And acetaminophen, Tylenol would fail. They would never make it through, through the animal and tissue culture trials now. So we're probably missing a lot of really good drugs also. Um, due to the sc obsolete screening methods. So what do we need to do? We need a totally new paradigm for drug screening. We need to, right now we're using obsolete, outdated screening technologies. We need drugs, we need technologies that are gonna make dr drugs fail, fail faster and cheaper. And what do I mean by that? We wanna shift this curve down. We want everything that's not gonna work in a human to flunk out before it even gets to human clinical trials. And then you're gonna drop the cost of drugs by at least a factor of 10, drug development. So how to make drugs fail quick, fast, and cheap and get a technology that can tell you. So if you think about it, um, if we have someone that learns to, wants to learn to fly, them on a fly a plane, we don't send them out on a bicycle to train. We build a simulator and we send them into the simulator and it rocks and looks just like a plane. So maybe what we wanna do for drug screening is build a human or an organ simulator. Build a technology that'll house little organ type systems and then connect them all together. So you basically kinda have this human replica. It's not you, but it's sort of a replica of you or of an intact human. And if we can do that, we'll shift away from all these obsolete technologies. Uh, we'll have better ways to do risk assessment. We'll probably use a lot fewer mice and the mice will be happy about that. We'll kill a lot fewer humans with bad side effects. We'll probably use fewer humans in drug studies also. Um, so we'll skip a lot of that part. We'll have fewer bad outcomes and we'll have better predictions. So it'll probably lead to cheaper, higher quality uh, drugs. 
How are we going to do this? Okay, this sounds like a great idea, like saying curing cancer is a great idea, but you've got to figure out how to do it, right? So it turns out we're going to look at the semiconductor industry. Um, and this is the technology and fabrication methods they make, uh, use to make computer chips, like in your iPhone. And we're going to adapt that to make integrated biochemical biofluidic circuitry, basically. So how are we going to do this? If you look at these semi semiconductor technologies, this is a little chip um, that you can, guy, you can get in a do-it-yourself home kit. That's a quarter over there, and so it's about a dime size. As cells and tissues, most of the structures are nanometers to microns. A cell is about 10 microns in diameter, about the tenth the width of a human hair. So we've got the right dimensions and everything. We can plumb inlets and outlets and contact ports and readout points. Not only that, the precision and the way you can place features and everything is astounding. This is one of the more advanced computer chips with thousands of little micron-sized elements on it. So the, the ability to place features is exquisite. And it's scalable. This is a silicon wafer, about a foot in diameter. The biggest one has got 100, over 150 chips on it. So there's the potential to fab at high capacity if you can do it right. But what are our design criteria? How are we going to make this work? It's great. My iPhone, though, isn't a human. Um, so we need to build something that's as human as possible. Um, it's physiologic. We're going to have to supply nutrients, oxygen. We're going to have to take away waste, take away carbon dioxide. And we're going to have to make it so we can measure from it. And it goes beyond that. We're going to have to make it so we'll support stem and differentiated cells. Um, it's going to have to have something that supports its shape. Like, I'm not an amorphous blob. I have a shape. I have supporting structure. Uh, we have a lot of forces, like when I breathe in, out. Many cells need to see that to work correctly, so we're going to have to apply some mechanical forces, potentially. A right architecture, size and shape. A lot of our organs are shaped by chemical gradients. Our fingers look the way we do because they were chemical gradients when we were embryos and developing. So we're going to have to figure out how to do that also. So this could be exciting and fun. Now, so now we get to organ on chip. And I'm going to show you how we're going to do this. And basically, the goal is to rebuild or recapitulate the minimal functioning unit of an organ and make it function just like it does in the body. So we're not going to rebuild the whole organ, but the minimal functional unit that we can study and that will function normally. So I'm going to show you some cool examples, and then I'm going to dive a little deeper into some of uh, the latest examples um, out in the research world. This is a blood-brain barrier on a chip uh, to look at how drugs can go from the bloodstream and cross into the brain. This is a kidney on a little silicon wafer, uh, and you can look at excretion. This is a bone on a chip, and you can see the transparent device and when it's got its all, all of its interconnects, and so you can actually grow bone marrow on it, and it, it looks like a bone. So the one to see the easiest is this is a liver on a chip, and you can see these little discrete elements. Each of those mimics a lobule of a, li of a liver, so the smallest functioning unit. So these miniaturized uh, organs are really designed to recapitulate the human environment. Um, and give you the look and feel of a real organ. And you can begin to probe it. So I'm going to give you some examples that I think are the, I think you'll find truly amazing. So first of all, a breathing lung on a chip um, that shows pressure oscillations on cells, and the cells look like they're breathing. Blood vessels on a chip with fluid flowing, and even tumor cells that are going to metastasize. Intestines on a chip, that's my work. So intestines that actually absorb food and transport nutrients. And then a beating heart on a chip, uh, which will be, I think, pretty amazing. So let's take a look at the lung. The smallest unit of a lung is the alveolus. Um, so it's these little air sacs down deep in the lung. And every time you um, exhale, they contract. And then when you inhale, they expand like this. So how are we going to do that? So this is out of Don Ingber's lab, by the way. Uh, he's up in Boston. So we build this little device. And re remember, it's not to rebuild the whole lung. So we're going to make it so there's uh, lung cells up top, and there's going to be a porous membrane 
with hexagonal holes you'll be able to see in a bit. And below it is going to be uh, endothelial, or cells that line blood vessels. So there'll be uh, blood flowing through the blood vessels. And then there are these little vacuum side chambers. And we're going to apply vacuums, and it'll stretch it and contract the membrane and the cells on it. So you'll vary the channel pressure, stretch the cells, and you'll have a blood-like fluid flow. This is the chip. Um, so you can see someone's hand, so it's not that big, a few centimeters. And you can see the blue is the uh, vacuum ports, and the red is the different ports to access the cells. This is what the device actually looked like when it's operating. So you can see all the tubing going in. And right off the bat, you can see this is not ready for prime time manufacturing, right? It's a prototype. Um, plumbing has got to be part of your job. So again, so up in the left hand is an image. The uh, green is the lung cells. There's a porous membrane that looks black, and then the blood vessels down below it. So off to your right is looking face down on this membrane. And you can see the hexagonal holes. It's easy to see through them. And there are lung cells and then blood cells on either side. So you can see now it's breathing. And you can see the whole thing expanding and contracting as you pressurize and depressurize the device. And if you look close up, these are two cells. And you can see them expanding and breathing also. And so one thing that's really important about these devices is to be able to quantify and really make uh, hardcore, really great measurements off the cells on the devices. So in each of these engineered devices, I'll show you, they've built in tools and technologies to do very sophisticated readouts. So in this case, they can actually track the cells. The blue is when you breathe in, and then red, blue out. And you can look at how much stretch the cells are going, having. So what can you do with this chip? So this is, our, again, our lung chip. And we're going to give it a lung infection. And then we're going to put some immune cells down below it. And we're going to look to see if the immune cells can actually sense the infected lung and do something about it. So off to the right, the image. So the, there's an immune cell labeled in white. You can see the hexagonal holes outlined. And it's down in the bloodstream. It's wandering around, and it's starting to say, hmm, there's a problem. There's some bacteria. It finds a hole. It goes up through the hole. It makes its way through the cells. And then you, it actually comes out the other side and is now up in the lung running around to get the bacteria. So another example of how it begins to behave like a normal tissue, there's actually a version of this chip called a pulmonary edema chip. So if you have a parent or a relative that has heart failure, they can't pump blood out of their lungs, so the blood pools, and you get fluid leaking into the lungs, and it begins to fill up with fluid. It's a tough problem to treat. They can do the same thing on this chip. So you put some inflammatory factors in the bottom, and they make it leaky, and fluid will flow into it. And you can measure how much fluid is on top of the lung now and how thick it is, and which drugs can aid in pumping the fluid back out. And mind you, these are with human cells. So this is kind of an example of our lung on a chip. So let's take a look now at blood vessels on a chip. Um, this is a, a really cool device, I think. And so we'll look off to the left. There'll be two fluid channels in pink and some blood vessels. You see kind of the red squiggly lines. Uh, the green are other channels that supply growth factors to the blood vessels to help them grow. Uh, this is a schematic on the, of the device on the right. It's actually a fairly complex looking device with a lot of little ports. The actual device, and you can see it's just a, a few centimeters or so. These are the blood vessels. So you can see uh, cells flowing through them. There's some void spaces where um, there's still collagen or matrix. Oops. Doesn't want to play again. But you can see some of the, they're patent nice blood vessels that things can flow through. So what can you do with this? So this is, I think, some of the most amazing work I've ever seen. So the blood vessels are now marked in red, and that's a tumor cell. 
and it's flowing through the blood vessels with uh, the serum and the red blood cells. And a lot of the time when you die of cancer, it's not the cancer at the primary site, right? It's because tumor cells have gone to distant sites, dislodged, somehow gotten out of the blood vessels and landed in the tissue and then started to really grow. So you can use these chips to study how tumors metastasize. So you can see it actually, there you go, it's coming out, it gets out of the blood vessel, it divides, and now it's outside the blood vessel growing. So you can study the features of ingress and egress of these tumor cells as they go in and really began to look using human tissue how to stop this metastasis process. So this is just an example of a series of steals, and you can see they're tracking them over many days. An original tumor cell, it metastasizes, gets out of the blood vessel, and grows into a tumor nodule. And then you can continue to study these and see how these big metastases grow. They can invade more tissue and actually then go back into the blood vessels to take off and go somewhere else. So again, an amazing type of technology and you could really begin to screen these types of vices for drugs that will slow down metastases or keep the tumor cells within the blood vessels. So this is our colon on a chip. Um, the smallest unit in a colon is called a crypt. So our um, intestine, both small and large, is lined with arrays of these crypts. And it's arranged so that they're sort of these oblong cylindrical structures. And the stem cells are all down at the bottom of the structure. And as the stem cells divide, they migrate up and they differentiate. They become mature, um, non-dividing cells. They live about a week on the top, and then they die. So the lumen of your intestine is a nasty place for a cell. So there has to be this really nice orderly procession. And it, so you might wonder, well, how does that work? How does that structure? How do the stem cells, stel, stem cells stay down in the bottom? How do they know that to go upward? Well, it turns out in the intestine, we're full of chemical gradients. And what do I mean by that? So there are growth factors that promote stem cell behavior, and they're high down in the bloodstream, or the base of the crypt. And then there are food products, which often cause our cells to differentiate and mature, and they're high in the lumen, but low in the base of the crib. So they're thought to be probably hundreds of chemical gradients across the, the lining of your intestine that really shape and control how the intestine cells grow and divide. And you can imagine, if you have colon cancer, that's an example where the gradients probably are not quite right, and the stem cells weren't getting the proper message that they shouldn't grow so fast and take over the organ, right? So we wanted to build a colon on a chip and recapitulate all of these different features. This is our device. We made it to be very simple. It's the little purple area in the center. If you look at it close, uh, oops, seems like things are going backwards here. This is actual what the device looks like over to the right. It's an array of about 100 crypt-shaped wells, and you can populate those with cells and cover them. And then they'll actually grow down a little close up. And these are what the cells look like. If you rip them out of there, you can see there's this array of crypt-shaped structures that looks very much what, like, what's like in the intestine. But even better, you can apply gradient, chemical gradients across these. And these are human cells, by the way. So if you have a relative that goes into the, um, go get a colonoscopy at UNC, people over 50 are supposed to do this. They'll ask you, will you give a little biopsy for research? And if you say yes, we'll probably get your little biopsy. And so we'll take your stem cells and we'll populate the devices. So it's really a device that recapitulates your intestinal epithelium. And so here you can see the growth factors are high on the bottom, low at the top. And what you can see off in the right is the dividing cells are all down at the base. And the mature differentiated cells are all up at the top. So you have a, a true shape to these colon crypts, and they re really resemble what it looks like in vivo. You can actually put food up top um, and bacterial metabolites, and they'll actually respond. So this is an example, our control, and one um, chemical is to the left. But look at butyrate. This is a short chain fatty acid that the bacteria make from fiber. And it actually shoves the cells down and 
slows down their proliferation. So um, these things are responsive to food. You can grow a small intestine in a very similar way with gradients of growth factors. There's our small intestine. There's a villi, which is a big absorptive area with differentiated cells. Uh, we can populate these structures, build them, and you can see what our arrays of villi look like. Uh, they look very much like the structures going in the intestine. So these now are being used to screen for drug transport, drug metabolism in the intestine. If you take a drug in orally and it never gets to the bloodstream, it didn't do you any good. So the last example I'll show you is a beating heart, um, which I think is really cool. So in the heart, we're going to look at a subunit, which is just an area of muscle that interacts and contracts as a unit all together at once. And the device we're going to build, they're going to build is this flexible cantilever structure. And they're going to embed a strain gauge or a circuitry. So what's a strain gauge? It's a wire that when it bends, the resistance changes. So you can put a current through it and measure, keep the voltage constant, and just measure a change in resistance as it bends. So that's what you're going to see. This is what the device actually looks like. These are some cells up on the left. These are human cardiac myocytes or muscle cells. Uh, the device on the far right has, let's see, eight, 16 little beating heart devices. Um, and you can see the outputs and everything. Uh, this is a little graph showing that the hearts beat, and I'll show you what they look like. More and more, I told you we were using microfab technologies, but more and more people are starting to use 3D printing. This is the printing of these hard-on chips, sped up, of course. They're printing the base layer. Now they're printing the electrical circuitry. Now they're printing uh, more of the surface and the reservoirs that the cells are going to sit in in fluid. So this is all done. Now those are the circuitry for the out for the um, electrical connections done 3d printed now it's ready for cells to be put on it so some pretty really um, awesome technologies so now we're going to look at these muscles and they don't look like a heart but they're going to beat so they're going to have diastole which is when the heart is relaxed systole when it's contract contracted and I'm not going to go through the math here, but they've done all sorts of complex math to model this so they can really measure cardiac output or cell beating power, if you will. So here's one of these. They spontaneously beat. And you can see the red bar just marks it, so you can see it beating. So all the cells are contracting in unison. You can track the heart rate or the beat rate of these cells and it's kind of like getting a little mini EKG if you will and you can see systole and diastole and all the different aspects of this beating heart then you can begin to do some really remember what I said is cardiac toxicity is a major problem with many drugs so you can begin to look and see what drugs are doing to a human heart so this is an example of verapamil it's used when people come in and their heart rate is way too fast and it's irregular. So they give it to patients and it slows down their heart and makes it more regular. If you give it too much, you can see what our beating heart does. It goes from a nice heartbeat to almost no heartbeat. So you can begin to look at drug overdoses and very um, subtle drug effects. Isoproteranol is a drug they give to people whose hearts are failing. They're not beating hard enough and fast enough. And so when you give it to them, it'll make it be faster and a better output for the heart. And you can see when you give it to our heart on chip, it's beating faster and harder. And you can measure the output power of these cells and show that it does just what you'd expect it to do. So again, here's our heart uh, spontaneously beating. Um, you can add a pacemaker or put the heart on a treadmill. So this is a heart that's being paced. It's going slow. It's going to speed up, and then it's going to get even faster. So basically, you can make little exercise rooms for these hearts and see what the exercise does to it, or you can engineer pacemakers that will intervene when they don't fire properly. So the kinds of things you can do are pretty, truly amazing. So now people are beginning to interconnect all these hearts together, these lungs, organs together. This is a two-organ module. 
it's pretty complex looking, and it is. A lot of fluidics and everything. This is the actual device. I'm looking at that, and I'm thinking leaks, 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 leaks. Um, it's a plumbing nightmare, but this is kind of the state of the art right now. And keeping this all sterile for months, I don't even want to think about that. Um, but it looks not so great, but think about it. If you look at back in 1926, this is the first liquid-fueled rocket. Really not so great looking. I'm sure it looked great then, but this is Robert Goddard. What happened this year? The, the, the um, SpaceX Falcon Heavy fired and lifted off, commercial air flight. So the amount of progress in really not that long a time has just been astounding. So if you begin to think on those kinds of dimensions, it won't be that long before we have a full integrated human on a chip device. And we'll really begin to recapitulate all the interconnected organs. You'll be able to give these drugs, um, like the little gut, you'll give it a drug. You'll see how it's absorbed. The drug will go to the liver. You'll see what the liver does it. The liver will dump the drug and its metabolites into a circulatory system that'll go through the little body. Um, it'll go to the heart, and you'll be able to see if the heart is still beating or if it's changed. Um, it might go to the kidneys to get excreted. Uh, it might go, we'll see what it does to the lung. You can have inhaled drugs that you give to the lung. So you can begin to really um, build enabling technologies that ought to really make drug, and these are all human cells, make drug development faster, um, cheaper, and maybe with fewer side effects when it gets to humans. So you might be thinking, where's the cells coming from from this device? I'm not giving you my intestine. Well, it turns out we can do a lot of really great things to get cells for these technologies. We can just get tissue biopsies. They'll live a short time, but they'll be very physiologic. We can actually now get stem cells from most organs. Like this little bitty colon biopsy we get is maybe a millimeter long. We can pull out the stem cells from it and repopulate a device from it. So we're going to have a lot of primary stem cells uh, that are sort of replicas of you. But more exciting is we're going to have, in the near future, induced pluripotent stem cells. That is, they'll take a nucleated blood cell or a fibroblast, they'll gene engineer it and send it back to stem cell state, and then move it forward. The beating heart you saw was from iPSC uh, cells from a human. So uh, connect, co uh, collected from skin fibroblast and converted back into heart cells. So it's pretty exciting technologies. So you can really begin to think we're going to have humans on chip. Um, and this is going to be a fundamentally new way of screening drugs. We'll have these essentially a large supply of human simulators. Um, and we'll, they'll provide potentially uh, personalized drug therapeutics. So we can actually have you on chip now. And there's me on chip. And I look now, I'm standing upright instead of lying down in a tish. But we can begin to develop personalized medic medical strategies where we can test uh, drugs on you in, in your model system rather than forcing you to undergo the side effects and saying, oh, sorry, that was a bad drug. The immune system circulates through all of our organs. We'll actually be able to study the immune system and how it moves through all these organs. It's going to be way better than that, though. So look at cosmetics. The European Union outlawed animal testing for cosmetics. They did even more than that. They said, if you develop a cosmetic in any other country, a new one, and you test it on humans, it's going to be illegal in Europe. So it's called the REACH uh, regulations. And so now they need ways to, to test all these cosmetics on human cells instead of animal model systems. You look in our household, there's all sorts of toxins. What if we could really look at these toxins before you put them into your house? Are your kids started handling? So, you know, coat hangers have really not good things. Uh, flame retardant coverings can do not so great things. A lot of the insecticides we use, but they could all be really tested and we'd know what their effects were. So we're, I think most of us believe we're really beginning to look at a new paradigm where we're going to do uh, fundamental science and really understand disease physiology and etiology how normal organs work and how disease organs work. And then there'll be a whole nother side branch where we do toxicity and drug testing. 
um, with the expectation that this will really revolutionize things. We also think it's going to be transformative. You're going to do things you could never do. You're going to be able to track the life cycle of an infectious agent throughout its human host. Malaria comes in, goes to the liver, the bloodstream. You'll be able to track it all in a human system. We'll get better racial and genetic diversity in clinical trials. Some people you can't study, like kids and pregnant women. They're just out of luck, um, and we hope it works on them. Uh, so complex diseases we'll be able to study much better that are due to interconnected organ systems. There'll be some really hard to study organs like brain that you'll begin to do experiments on. It won't do everything. It won't replace your organs. You won't have cognitive processes on a chip, uh, but it'll really begin to make some really huge inroads. So you might be thinking, OK, can I buy one of these? I want to start using one in my lab. So right now, all of the technology is mostly early stage companies that are spin outs from academic labs. So they're still working on technology and production problems. You saw that vice I showed you with all the tubes. No one's selling that. Um, and so they need to figure out how to scale up. But there's a lot of companies out there now that are beginning to build these technologies. And if you look at what's going in, I think one of the most exciting things is people are starting to invest money. The federal government, NIH, teamed up with DARPA and invested over $200 million on a five-year time window. It's really propelling these things forward. Um, importantly, uh, the investors out there, business investors, are starting to sink money into these. So these are some of the chips that are out there. Um, we expect people often ask, well, what are they going to be used for? High throughput, low throughput? We'll probably have different chips for different jobs. So there are going to be a group that are very high complexity, so you can extract very intricate knowledge, but they're going to be low throughput. And there'll probably be another group of chips that are much, a little simpler, less complex, but very high throughput, so you can do screens. So there may be many different chips along the way in the drug screening process, but in the end, you're going to be screening drugs on tissue, interconnected organs, and it'll be human origin with many human-like properties. And you'll look at how the organs crosstalk and interact together. And then I feel like I have to say this. It's still a great potential, but a lot of hype. Um, so I'm telling you all the cool and wonderful things that we expect. We still have a long ways to go. Uh, these are the types of money, though, these companies are beginning to raise. You can see back in 2013, it was not very much. But some of the companies like Emulate are really beginning to raise large sums of money. And I think that's a metric of, well, OK, this is a good risk. We're going to do it, and this is going to have some real potential. So we're beginning to see a lot more investment in these companies, um, which is good in terms of getting it out for you to use it and giving you better health and better drugs. The field is expected to grow at about a rate of 63 uh, percent over the, till, up until 2023. And it's going to be start of a $170 million market, not too big. But after that, it's expected to go into a multi-billion dollar market as it moves into high throughput drug screening and drug development technologies. So not only will it likely save money, but it'll get rid of a lot of ethical concerns. We won't have to kill as many animals. We won't have to um, expose a, as many people uh, to drugs that are untested. So I always give a little shout out to my lab. This is the crew that I'm really fortunate to work with, and a good fraction of them are doing the colon on the chip technology. And so as we say, we're, we're building poop on a chip, and we think it's really exciting. And this is the team that's uh, doing it. So I just want to uh, thank the audience for taking the time and hearing about Argonon chips, and I think it's really going to be an exciting future. <laughs>